Good morning, everyone. As you're filing in, please go ahead and add the name of your organization and the country that you're joining us from in the chat so we can see where everyone's coming from today. We'll begin in just a few moments. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to begin in a few moments, but please go ahead and add the country and organization that you're joining us from in the chat so we can get to see where everyone's from. Wonderful. Malawi, Nigeria, Zambia. Fantastic. Great to see everyone today. We'll begin in just another minute or so. We'll allow everybody to file into the room. Today's webinar is telling your project's story. And my name is Susan Melnick. I'm the ASAP communications and graphics specialist. Joining us from Mozambique, South Africa. Fantastic, wonderful. It's great to see everyone today. So we'll just give it one more moment and we can go again ahead and get started. We have quite the presentation today and some wonderful presenters. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started because we do have a number of slides today and some wonderful presentations and I don't want you to miss anything. So um, again, my name is Susan Melnick and I'm the communications and graphics specialist here at ASAP, which is a USAID project, accelerating support to advanced local partners. And I'm really excited to see everybody joining us today. Go ahead and add your organization and country name into the chat so we can see where everyone's from. Uh, right across the world, it looks like, which is wonderful. All right. So um, let's just go over a couple of quick things with our agenda. Um, we're going to start with some introductions to your presenters today and also an overview of the ASAP webinars and where you can find this recording when we're done. Um, we're going to focus today on why communication matters, help you identify your audience look at uh, success stories and dig a little bit deeper there. We have great presentations from InterHealth International with repackaging your content. So taking one piece of content and using it in a variety of ways, which we all need to do since we're working with you know, minimal resources in order to get our projects and our organization's uh, results communicated. We're gonna go over consent and disclosures, which is a really important part of any of the uh, beneficiary results that we're sharing. And we're going to uh, share some USAID communications and resources so that you can see where USAID is sharing some of your information and also some of the resources that their communications teams have put together in order to help you better communicate your results. And then last but not least, really an excellent presentation from Right to Care. They're gonna be talking about storytelling in action and giving you some really incredible tips and walking you through um, how they handle a campaign. So we're really looking forward to that. So a few quick notes, if you've uh, taken part in our webinars in the past, this part is old news, you know all of this, but in case you're new, I just want to go over a couple things. So welcome again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, these webinars are put on by USAID PEPFAR, and we are really, really glad to be able to put these on every week. Um, we use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So as you'll notice right now, at the very bottom of your screen, there are a couple of different options. One is chat, and you can feel free to chat with other attendees and the panelists in there. But for your questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A box. Uh, it just really allows us to track the questions and to answer them in order, make sure we don't miss any. We do have two polls today. One we're gonna have in just a couple of minutes, and one will be at the very end of the webinar. And um, if you have the newest uh, Zoom uh, download, it should pop up on your screen. The presentation for today will be, uh, is being recorded and you're going to be able to access this tomorrow on the um, InterHealth website. We'll go ahead and link that to you in the chat in just a little bit. 
All right, so a couple of um, in, bits of information about the webinars. So our webinars are USAID and PEPFAR funded, and we have actually done 70 to date. So this is our 71st webinar, which is pretty incredible. Uh, there's a really great team putting these on behind the scenes. You can't see them right now, but they're uh, so incredibly helpful. And um, we've had more than 14,500 attendees, which is pretty amazing. So thank you all so much for coming today. And many of these webinars are available online. So again, we'll share that link. You can share it with colleagues. You can go back and look at webinars. Um, really handy to be able to check back on the information. Many of our webinars are available in three languages, and you can actually filter on the website to choose the language. So French, Portuguese, or English, and those specific webinars will pop up. And on the page, uh, we have the recording of the webinar, which you can rewatch. And also um, for most of the webinars, a presentation PDF that you can download. So if you missed anything during today's webinar, um, or if there's a link that you'd like to be able to check out, we've made sure to include that in the uh, PDF. So we'll be sure to supply that. Um, it'll be online by tomorrow morning. All right, so we have some upcoming webinars. Um, on March 9th, we have USAID Financial Policies, Internal Controls and Compliance. March 16th, Optimizing Gender in the Workplace. On March 22nd, we have a French webinar and it's Program and Data Quality Assurance and Improvement. March 23rd is Subaward Management from Solicitation to Closeout. And March 29th is Business Development. So again, this link will be available in the presentation PDF. Um, and one of my colleagues will share the link in the chat in a little bit. So you can sign up for any of these um, in advance and you'll get a reminder before the webinar. And today's presenters, I've already introduced myself, so I don't need to do that again. Um, but I'd like to go ahead and introduce our other two presenters. Catherine Seaton is the Senior Communications Writer and Editor for IntraHealth International. And there she is, you can see her on screen. Um, and Sky Grove is the Senior Technical Specialist for Social and Behavior Change Communication at Right to Care. Let me just see it. Perfect. They're both on screen. Wonderful. So it's great to see you both today. Thank you so much. And we can't wait to get to your parts of the presentation. All right. So we're going to start with a poll. And there are four questions with this poll. Um, I think I can go ahead and launch it. So here we go. I'm going to launch it. And it should pop up on your screen. So um, here's the questions. First one is, is your communications your primary role? So is it mainly what you do for your job at your project or organization? So go ahead and um, answer those. Second question is how many people are on your communications team? And this is just to give us an idea, you know, are you working all on your own? Do you have a big team behind you? Um, it's great for us when we're developing these webinars to have a better understanding of what you're working with. Third question is, do you currently have the resources you need to effectively communicate your project's results? Um, you know, when we're working with NGOs, often we're working on a limited budget and we're trying to make the most out of it. So it's helpful for us to understand where you're at. And then last question is, which tools are you actively using for your project? So if you can answer this considering what you are currently using, you may have a website or a blog, but if you're not updating it regularly, you know, you're probably not actively using it. So this will give us a little idea. So we'll wait just a couple more seconds for results to come in. And so I know those were a number of questions, but as I'm looking at things now, so it looks like the majority of you, about 70% uh, communication is your main role. Uh, looks like you range quite a bit in the size of your team, which is good to know. Do you currently have the resources? So for most of you, you have some of them. Um, but you would certainly like some more resources, which I think we all would, you know, staff, um, extra training, you know, some of the, you know, camera, video equipment, that type of thing. All right. And it looks like uh, for the tools that you're using, so success stories are a strong one that you're using, um, but it looks like actually you have a lot of different ones. So let me go ahead and end this poll and I'm going to share the results so you all can see as well. So that's really interesting. Um, wonderful to know. And we really appreciate you uh, filling that out. We do have one more poll at the very end of the webinar. 
I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing that and get back to our presentation. All right. So the big question, of course, is why does communications matter? Um, we know as communicators that it's incredibly important, but sometimes it's our job to advocate and educate um, the rest of our organization or project team as to, to why communications is really everybody's uh, concern on a project or for an organization. So part of why it's so important is the flow of information. So your project team is in the field, they are implementing, they are incredibly busy, they're getting so much done. But in order for your donor and your community to hear about these wonderful things, um, we really need to be the communicators in the middle. We need to turn all that information that's coming in from the field into reports and photos, presentations, videos, and success stories. Because as much work as is happening, um, the donor is often only going to see the work through these types of tools. So it's really important. We're sort of in the middle there. Uh, and it's an important part of the flow of information. So something that uh, I think anyone who's worked in communications for any period of time is like their pain point is this, um, trying to get everyone to think about communications right from the start. So it's really important to build it into your proposal, into your budget, into your work plan. And it's our job as communicators to advocate for communications. We need to help our team, organization, and donors better understand the value that it brings. And that's really on us. That's a big part of our job, is to communicate that both within the organization and within our project and to external audiences. So let's go ahead and talk about audiences. Who's your audience and why are you communicating with them? I think this is something that we often move through very quickly when it comes to uh, communications planning. We sort of think we know who our audience is. It's very simple. If we're a project, it's our donor. Our donor is our audience. Um, it might be our beneficiaries, but then that's it, right? That's mainly who we're focused on. But I think it's really important to really think through each of your audiences and realize that the way you're going to communicate with each of them is going to be a little bit different. So let's talk about types of audiences. So external audiences is one of the most obvious ones for a project or an organization. Obviously, the donor is really an important one that gets focused on early on. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that you have contractual and award requirements, so actual obligations within your contract with your donor to share your progress, results, and lessons learned. And we do this, of course, through reports, success stories, presentations, and any other requested deliverables like that. It's important because we're looking to raise the visibility of not just our project, obviously, but our donors' work. So when we share this, the donor is then going to take that and share it a little bit more widely to promote uh, the actual organization. And that's a very important part of what we're doing. We're creating communications to be handed off as well to help to uh, bolster the donor's work. And we are positioning our organization for new project opportunities. So by communicating with our donor, we're also you know, raising the profile of our organization with that donor and hopefully with potential other donors. Another important external audience is your project's beneficiaries. Depending on your project, this is gonna vary quite a bit. Um, for some projects, obviously your beneficiary is community members. Um, for others, it may be businesses within your community. It depends on the type of project that you're running. And for global health, obviously, it's often people currently using your services, as well as the larger community. So you're looking to um, raise your visibility of the organization, both among your current beneficiaries and all potential. So a few ways that you're doing this is, and why you're doing it, is to raise visibility, like I said. You're looking to also advocate for issues that are important for your organization, build goodwill towards your organization. This one is an important one because by sharing you know, your wins and successes and your hard work uh, within the community, you're building goodwill that you can uh, you know, be able to tap into later when you need a call to action. And we're also looking to reach beyond current donors for future funding opportunities. This one is very crucial for all of us with sustainability. You know, um, the current funding that you're working with 
Um, you know, you need to focus on that, of course, and report, but you also need to be thinking about the next step, the next funder, um, and expanding your funders. So an audience that I personally think is so important and I think often gets missed a bit is your internal audience. So this is project staff, um, your organization's employees that are not currently working on your project, board members and advisory teams. And I think this is a very important thing for implementation because we're all implementing very quickly. We're get, making these projects work uh, in a very fast timeline with a fairly heavy workload. And it's important to do a couple of things when it comes to internal communications um, to really harness that uh, energy and information. So with your colleagues, you're communicating so that you can share lessons learned to build knowledge in your organization. You're looking to raise visibility of your project's work within your organization, which is important, um, and also to build and improve your team's morale by sharing wins and successes. Um, personally, I think this one is incredibly important and something that we often miss because we're so busy communicating to the donor um, or communicating to our community. We have to remember that um, as hard as our internal team is working, as hard as your project staff is working, it, it's wonderful that for them to also be a part of celebrating those successes and those wins. Um, so it's a great way, uh, uh, internal newsletter, uh, social media, it can be a great way to help build your internal staff as well as external. So a few things about your audience. Um, I personally believe that it's really important to observe your audience and listen before we start communicating with them. So start to watch where are they communicating? You know, what types of social media, what types of platforms? Um, something to consider about social media that's very important is not every platform is going to fit your organization or your message. Um, obviously, there's a lot of new platforms coming out pretty much every day. Uh, if, like me, you went to college a while ago, um, you know, all this stuff is brand new. So it's important to keep up on it, but don't necessarily jump into every pool. Sit back and watch a little bit and see how things are progressing and where you're where it's appropriate for your organization or project to um, step in. Now, newsletters are another great way um, that people communicate and you can kind of keep an eye and sign up for newsletters that your community is currently um, utilizing. And websites and blogs, you know, what websites and blogs are they reading? How active are they? How often are they posting? Um, and local and national press, of course. And sometimes, you know, um, it's very common, I think, for projects to want to get a ton of national press. But if your project is actually focused in a specific community and in a much more detailed geographic area, I would really recommend looking towards local press. Sometimes local newspapers, local blogs um, are really the better way to reach a smaller, more succinct, more specific audience. So while you're listening and observing your audience, um, really focus on how they're communicating. What are they using? Um, you know, blog posts, photos, what are they responding to? Um, you know, you, sometimes you can write a quite lengthy article and it gets a tons of response. Sometimes you do a photo journalist article, which is gonna be just a number of photos that you're sharing. And that might actually get much more engagement. So keep an eye on how they're responding and how they're communicating. And then the tone and style is very important. You know, different types of communications are gonna require different tones. So obviously our reports are more formal. Social media is often more casual. You have to sort of decide uh, how people are communicating in each of these different areas, but also what's appropriate for your organization and for your project. Um, sometimes, you know, being quite playful uh, works for some things and not for others. So it's definitely something to consider. And I just want to give a quick note about social media. Um, there's a lot of focus on the metrics because of course, every social media platform has uh, you know, an incredible dashboard that you can pull from. Uh, you can easily take screenshots and download graphs and pull them into reports to share. And that's important. Metrics are very important, but it's also important what you're measuring. So it's not about the count, it's really about the connection. Consider your community. What is the size of your community? 
Um, and consider who your target audience is and are you reaching them? So sometimes I see organizations really push to end up with you know, 100,000 followers, but actually maybe your community is much smaller than that. And maybe you're uh, communicating a little bit too widely and not actually speaking to the people that you wanna be speaking to. So make sure within your organization, you're also advocating and educating for the metrics that matter. It's our job to you know, share not just what the metrics are, but what they mean, and sometimes what they don't mean. Because again, you know, having 100,000 more followers, but having much less engagement overall, that's not necessarily what you want. So it's important for you to also advocate and educate uh, your own staff and your organization. So a couple of key ways to tell your story. Um, we're always doing a lot more with less. You know, we're often taking one person and trying to make sure that they can uh, take care of a ton of deliverables. And so let's talk a little bit about the types of ways that you can tell your story. And then we're going to get into how to repackage your story, which is a really um, useful budget way of producing communications. So seven key ways. Well, obviously we have USAID and our donor reports. Uh, these are incredibly important and of course, part of our contractual agreement with our donors. Um, for USAID, their success stories. Uh, other donors call them slightly different things, but the story is basically the same. Uh, it's similar to a article or press release type style. And um, it's going to be usually shared sometimes in newsletters and in print, but most often on websites and in blogs. There are press releases. Um, something to consider here is, of course, your personal or your organization's contract with your funder. So is your donor requiring you to go through them for all of this type of thing? Um, you can still write the press release and submit it to them, and perhaps then they'll send it out. It depends quite a bit on your contract and your cooperative agreement. So be sure to uh, fine tooth comb your contract and your branding and marketing uh, guidelines. Presentations are another way, um, whether it's to your community or to your donors. Newsletters, blog posts on your organization's website, and of course, social media. And again, some of these things are gonna be affected by your contract and your cooperative agreement. Um, so be sure to you know, take a good look at that before beginning any communications projects. So we're gonna quickly go into um, repackaging content and what that means. And then I'm gonna happily pass it over to Catherine uh, Seaton from Interna Inter Health International. And she's gonna go ahead and provide a little bit more information. So just quickly, what is repackaging? Well, you're basically starting with one piece of content and you're gonna split it out into a lot of different ways. Um, so for example, if you do an interview with a beneficiary, there's many different ways for you to now present this information. The first could be a success story that you write up and submit to USAID. The next might be taking that success story or a version of it and including it in a text box in your report. Um, I love to call these call out boxes because I think that's really what they do. They call out your uh, successes within your reports. And if we're honest, you know, everybody's really busy. Donors are very busy. You don't always have time to fine tooth comb your entire report. So as they're skimming through, these call-out boxes really can catch their eye. Um, you can take this information and repackage it a little bit and write a press release to submit to local media. You can record the interview on video or audio. We're gonna talk a little bit more about those later and about disclosures and consent around them. And you can insert a clip in your next report or share in your next meeting with a donor. You can take photos at the interview um, to include in your success story. I know in this time of COVID, sometimes we aren't able to do our interviews in person. So you could take a screenshot of a video interview that you're doing and include that. Um, and this is something that you can share in your next meeting or presentation with your donor. Take some photos at the interview to include in your success story, um, in reports and as social media posts. And go ahead and pull quotes from your interview. And you can use these to share on social media. And you can also add a snippet to your newsletter and link it to your website or blog. So just from one piece of content, you've got seven different ways that you could go ahead and repackage that and use it. And it's basically taking you know, the little resources that we're all working with and trying to make the most of it. 
So now I'm looking forward to passing this over, I'll go off camera, uh, to Catherine Seaton, who's going to talk a little bit more about the real details of repackaging. Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Seaton. I'm the Senior Communications Specialist at IntraHealth International. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how we use all of that content Susan just talked about um, to disseminate it to our different audiences. Uh, so next slide, please, Susan. Okay, so we use four major ways to disseminate our content. Uh, you can click next. The first one is our blog, which is called Vital. And you can see here, this is just our, a screenshot of our, um, the first three blog posts of our, of our blog on our website. <clears throat> this is for a more informal way to tell stories, highlight results, share any opinions you may wanna get across to your audiences. Our second piece is a, a news, news items. And that's, you can click next, please. And so this is um, highlighting something that happens at our organization. It could be a major success, any results we wanna to relay to our audience. If we've had a new project that's just been announced, we wanna put it here. Um, and then things like if we have a new board member or a new high level staff member, we'll announce it in this section of our website as well. Um, our third way is social media. Um, you can see here, these are screenshots of our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram page. Um, and we also have an Instagram account. And then the fourth way is through email. So this is a, a screenshot of an email we sent recently. Um, and we just use um, a service called MailChimp to send out emails um, periodically, usually once a week or once every two weeks or so. So I'm just going to take you through the steps uh, we take to make sure that we're raising the visibility of our content and therefore raising the visibility of IntraHealth as an organization. Um, I am gonna use the same piece of content throughout so you can see how versatile it is um, and how we use the same piece across all these four platforms. Next slide, please. So our first step is to publish. As you can see here, um, oops, sorry, excuse me. Um, once we have content finalized um, and we have a draft written, we determine where we want it to be published. Um, some of our options include on our blog vital, um, as a news item on our website, or we might um, try to publish this in an external website um, or maybe a newspaper or a magazine, uh, whatever is the most appropriate fit for this piece. In this case, I'm gonna focus on a news item that we published recently about our USAID funded NEMA project in Senegal. Um, this project just ended and it had some really, really great results that we wanted to highlight. Uh, so we actually read an end of project report in the comms team and we took some of those results and we turned them into a news item about how thanks to IntraHealth's NEMA project, mothers and babies are now getting better access to high quality services. But we didn't stop there. Once we published the news article on our website, we turned to social media. Next slide, please. As you can see here, our second step is to share the content that we just published on our website. Um, so we turn them into different social media posts. Um, for example, we posted this item on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, for social media, we follow um, a rule of threes, which is pretty common in communications, which means that we post this article on our social media sites three times over the course of a week to get greater visibility. And you can see here are a few examples of our NEMA news item on social media. Um, we also in these posts tag anyone who may have partnered with us on the project as a way to get more visibility and kind of show that we're, we're really grateful for their support and their partnerships. Um, and we also try to include as any relevant hashtags, especially for Instagram and Twitter, which rely pretty heavily on hashtags to share content. You can see here um, on the left is a Twitter post, in the middle is a LinkedIn post, and on the right is an Instagram post. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So our third step is to share that content via email and send it. Um, 
So people might not often have social media accounts. They might not necessarily see this content on our website. So we like to push it out to our subscribers, um, which we have through, as I said earlier, a, a platform called MailChimp. Um, if you can click There we go. So this is just a closer view of our intro to our email. It includes the title of the piece, the news article, and then a very, very brief explanation of what someone is about to read with a, with a link to clicking to read the full article. Um, this is really important. We don't wanna put the full article in the email, but it's really important for somebody to, on first glimpse, be able to see what it is that they are about to read if they do wanna click. And then you can click again, please. We also include um, a resource um, alongside our news item. So this could be anything related to the project we're talking about. It could be technical briefs, it could be videos, it could be a social media post we um, think would be great for other people to share. Um, so any relevant resources that we have that are related to this news item um, or anything that we're trying to email to everybody, we also include in the email. Okay, you can go to the next slide. And then we share and send again as much as we can. So as Susan said, we're really repackaging as much content as we can. So you can see this screenshot on the right of another email we sent, I would say probably a month later, um, which highlights a lot of the technical briefs from our NEMA project, as well as a little bit more in-depth information about some of the results that we achieved. Um, and these are clickable, so everyone can click on all three of these technical briefs, um, as well as any of the information in the body of the email. Um, we also share on social media again and again. So by sharing this new email with new content, we can also share um, things on social again. So for example, we heard back from our NEMA team that they had had an end of project um, gathering and they had a lot of really great photos from that event. So we took those photos from our team that they had sent us and we repackaged it into a social media post. You can see here, this is these are a few photos from the NEMA closeout gathering um, that we shared on, on Twitter. Um, and people really like to see um, photos on Twitter. It's a great visual medium. Um, so this is another great way to share any photos that you may have, even if they're not related to um, a specific blog or a specific news item. We, you can click again, please. So then you can also see our posts here of each of the uh, corresponding technical briefs. So you can see the three technical briefs are listed in our email on the right side of the page. And then we've also turned them into social media posts. Um, you can click again, please, Susan. So here are the three technical briefs that we turned into all three of them we turned into separate social media posts. Um, so this is another great way to share your results with your audience on social media um, in a very honed in and clear way. So our next step is to measure. As Susan said, analytics really <clears throat> make a difference and they tell you exactly what um, your audience is thinking. Um, it is really important to think about the, the types of measurement you're doing and what's important to measure. Um, in this case, I, I've shown you here that Twitter has an analytics section on its website, as does um, LinkedIn and Facebook, um, which is called on Facebook, it's called Insights. And it's always important to keep track of how your audience is interacting with your content. Um, we use Google Analytics on our website, which is also really helpful to see how many people are viewing our news item, for example, how many people have gone to the page and read it, and how long people are staying on the page to read the full content. Um, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, <clears throat> excuse me, we all use the, the backend analytics to just see how our audience is interacting with our content. Um, what they do and don't like. If we get a lot of likes on some content, but we don't get a lot on others, it's just really helpful to know how our audience is interacting with us. And then from there, we can tailor our content and produce um, more and more content of what they do like and less content of what they don't really care about. So those are the five steps that we go through um, almost on a weekly basis. We try to create as much content as we can 
um, that is really um, helps inform the audience about what we do um, as an organization around the world. Um, there are a really few, some helpful notes that we keep in, keep in mind when we're doing this. Um, we try to make sure that we know our audience um, as well as we possibly can. Um, if we don't know what they're interested in, we don't know where they're from, who they work for, uh, where they live, it's a lot harder to create content. Um, so by measuring and understanding where they're coming from and who they work for, and just making sure we're monitoring our subscriber lists and our follows, things like that, that's really helpful for us to create content moving forward. We also try to write in as simple, clear, easy to understand language as we possibly can. Um, that way it reaches a lot of audiences and it's not hard to understand. I can say from personal experience, reading a lot of reports from projects, I have a hard time understanding things sometimes. Um, so we try to break that down in a really clear and easy to understand way. We also try to switch up our content a lot. So making sure we're not using the same text for different platforms. Um, a Twitter, for example, I'm sure you all know a Twitter um, post is a maximum of 280 characters. So making sure that we can fully explain something in a really, really brief way, clear and brief way for Twitter, but LinkedIn and Facebook don't have those same parameters. Um, so just making sure we're tailoring our content to each of those platforms and we're making sure that we're not boring our readers um, across all of the same platforms, all the different platforms, excuse me. We also think a lot about how to bring the reader in. Um, what does your audience want to hear from you? Why is it interesting? We talk a lot on our team about subject lines and preview text lines, the first two lines that someone may read. Um, in uh, the email, for example. So when you see an email come into your inbox, what's really gonna pull you in and make you wanna click on that email and read it? So making sure that it's enticing and it makes somebody wanna click um, and learn more. We also use uh, social media scheduling so that we're not um, posting always in real time. Um, this means that we use actually use platforms um, like Loomly or Hootsuite or a buffer to help you schedule social media posts in advance. So we have a full schedule that we make sure is always pretty robust. Um, and we know when things will be posted and that's really helpful because then you're not always focusing your time all the time on um, making sure you're posting constantly in real time. And then one of the main things is just keep your website up to date. We post a lot of links uh, constantly to our website on social media, in our news items, our blogs. We're always referring back to our website. And if our website isn't up to date, it's really hard to stay, to keep people engaged um, because if our website is out of date, then it's not helpful information. Um, so we make sure that we always, as a comms team, keep our website up to date, but we also rely really heavily on our colleagues in our um, organization to tell us like, hey, we've noticed that maybe this page isn't updated. Could you just check on that? And we'll go in and we'll make some edits and make sure it's um, up to date. So these are just a few helpful things to know as you start to repackage your content. I think that's the end of my slides. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Perfect. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and we had a couple of questions, and I just want to remind everyone, we're going to go ahead and answer questions, I think, at the end of today's webinar. But the entire team is here um, to answer your questions, so keep them coming. Again, it's really helpful for us if you can put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, rather than just in the chat. Um, I'm sure if you've been watching the chat, you notice that uh, it moves quite quickly, and sometimes we lose the questions if they're in there. But if you put them in the Q&A box, we can really track them. So um, before I get into the rest of the presentation, I also just wanted to, um, Catherine really reminded me about having a content calendar. So as she mentioned, it's really important to keep things up to date, but having a, an overall content calendar is really incredibly useful. So for your project and organization, um, you can be thinking about um, any things that you'd be able to, on an annual basis, promote. Um, perhaps it's the one year anniversary of your project or your organization. Um, perhaps you have, you know, 
something like that. Holidays, you can put them in there. So that can really help you to kind of get started on your content. I know sometimes it's very overwhelming um, to build a content calendar, but go ahead and put some of those simple things in first and you'll be surprised how quickly they build up. Um, so we will move on now to uh, success stories. We're gonna look a little bit closer and these are specifically going to be um, USAID's approach to success stories, but this all applies um, to pretty much any donor success stories and to be honest, almost to any media when it comes to writing articles. So first off, let's talk about what makes a great title. Um, and what's really important in a title is that it's very short and super concise. So uh, for USAID success stories, you can always take a look at the um, success stories that are on their website, considering of course that those are the ones they considered most worthy to publish since they get hundreds of them every year, I'm sure. Um, and so they're really good examples of what they're looking for in a finished product. And you really wanna try and make sure that your product is as finished as possible. It'll be much easier for either your donor um, or the media to share if you basically give them a finished product. So for a title, we're gonna talk about keeping it really short. So ideally under 10 words, um, keep it super concise. What did you do? Why did it matter? And very descriptive. For USAID success stories, because they work around the world, it's very useful to include the country name in fact, if you don't, the comms team will almost always try and work it in, uh, which means, again, you're creating a little more work for them. So if you can go ahead and do that, that'll save them a lot of time and trouble and make it more likely that your product might get um, shown on the website. So let's look a little closer at how to develop a good title. So this one specifically, Improving Malaria Treatment and Saving Lives in Uganda, is very short. It's only eight words six keywords. Um, it's very concise and descriptive. They talk about what they did improving malaria treatment and why it mattered, saving lives. And they included the country name, Uganda. So it sounds simple, but of course, as we all know, any of us who have written anything in our lives, which is all of us here, um, it can be really tricky to take an entire article and make it um, short and interesting to make the title really concise. So if you can't fit it all um, in the title, which ideally that's where your focus is going to be, you can also use a subtitle. Um, keep in mind, the subtitle can be great to highlight some more information, but it sometimes gets um, missed or deleted. So depending on the format this is gonna end up in, sometimes blog posts, um, newsletters, social media posts, sometimes the subtitle gets lost. So just make sure that your key information is in your main title. Um, you know, what's really important uh, for almost any beneficiary results that you're sharing is to include quotes and photos to make a story personal. Um, it really is help, what helps people connect. And of course, we're in a world that's moving very fast when it comes to um, all of the communications that we're receiving every single day. So um, it's really important to include some, you know, high resolution, good quality photos and some quotations so that we can really hear from beneficiaries um, and hear it in their own words. So let's talk a little bit more about the success story as a whole and how to put it together. There are some really key components to every success story. Again, this is USAID's snapshot or success story template and it's available on their website and we'll make sure that uh, we have links uh, within the presentation as well that we're gonna share tomorrow. But there's a couple of key parts and these things apply, um, whether it's a, really if it's a press release or it's an article or it's a success story or even a little call out box um, in your final reports or quarterly reports. So a photo is very important. It's really important to submit a high resolution file with that. So as you can see here, this is quite a small um, photo included. And what people do in this case, they're inserting it into a Word document or a PDF. But when you go to actually submit this, whether it's a press release or it's a donor um, success story, go ahead and make sure that you have a higher resolution file of that photo to include. Because even though here it's used small, when this information is repackaged, it might be used um, in a video, presentation, social media post, 
Um, and nothing is worse than being really excited about sharing um, a great story from uh, one of your projects only to find out that the photo is quite a low resolution and not gonna work. So if it's the difference between your story being shared and somebody else's, um, sometimes the photo quality can make the difference. And this is true for media as well. So please um, go ahead and try and take as high resolution photo as you can. The caption is very important. I often see captions um, that are just, you know, the name of the person in the photo, maybe the name of the organization and the date. And although that's important information to include, you'll notice here that they actually are um, providing a lot more information about the project and about the outcome. So you can use your captions as another description of uh, what you did. Go ahead and make sure you include some quotes. So in this one here, all of the yellow boxes are quotes. As you can see, it's not just one on the left-hand side. Uh, we call that a pull quote. It's been pulled out of the main article but they also have uh, quotes brought into the body of the article. So again, it's really important to hear uh, from your beneficiaries and you don't wanna use just any quotes. You're really looking for quotes that are um, in their own words. That's the first and most important part, but also that are gonna highlight some of your results or successes. Um, a big part of writing these success stories is to frame the challenge. So you don't just wanna talk about what you did in your success, but why was it a challenge to begin with? Why are you there? Why is your project there to assist? So what is the challenge that beneficiaries were facing before your project or your organization came on the scene? Um, there's gonna be a section for you to describe your project. You're gonna to wanna to do this as you know, summarized and clean as you can, uh, but it is an important part of highlighting what's been done. And then of course, use data strategically. So there is uh, green boxes you see on the screen. Each of those green boxes contains data about the project um, or about the challenge that they were facing. And so it's really important to remember, don't just stick one little piece of data in there, try and weave it throughout your, um, your communications material, whether it's a success story or your presentations. Um, I did want to point out that the last paragraph is really important. And sometimes what happens is that um, it sort of ends up sort of being a bit of filler, but actually that last paragraph should really hit hard. Um, so if you've ever taken debate courses or anything, talked about debating, um, you know, your final sort of uh, argument is one of the most important parts. So consider that last paragraph as the thing that people are really going to be. Um, remembering about your, uh, your success story and try and make sure that it's what you want them to take away from it. So just as a reminder, again, quotes and photos are really important. They're what make a story personal. It's what helps you to connect to a story and a project and the work that's being done. Um, but data is what makes it powerful. And so those two things really do need to come together when you're writing. Um, and since we have a number of uh, editors presenting today and <laughs> on staff here today, I just wanted to remind you how important editing is. Um, this is kind of one of those things that because we move so quickly in a very fast paced environment, um, and certainly because we're almost all working with NGOs in the nonprofit sector, um, you know, we don't always have the resources we need or the time we need to keep going over and revising a piece as much as we'd like. Um, but it is really, really crucial. Again, it makes it easier for your donor to share because they don't have to go through and do any extra editing. Um, same for editors, um, at, for newspapers and magazines, if you're submitting press releases, you know, if you make it as ready to go as possible, it's really helpful. So reread your work with fresh eyes, walk away from it, come back, read it again. Um, I really recommend sharing your writing with others. So let other people review it, not necessarily just your project staff. Sometimes, you know, we're in a bit of a silo. We're so focused on what we are uh, working on. And we already know all the acronyms. We know all of the jargon. We know what our project is doing. It's good to have somebody from outside of your project to review it. And they might have questions um, that, you know, regular community members might also have, or perhaps members of your donor's team that aren't as familiar with your project. So let other people give you some um, criticism. 
there's a great quote, and I can't remember at the moment uh, who said it, but it's, do not seek praise, seek criticism. And I personally love this quote, because um, I think if you want to get better, it's really the only way. So you're looking for, you know, constructive criticism, and it makes your work much better. Um, go ahead and revise your first draft. And then when everything's said and done, please edit one more time. You know, if you've had several different people working on a piece, they may have added a different section. Um, and it's really, really crucial to make sure that you do one final read through so that there isn't anything missed and it's as professional um, a piece as you're ready to submit. Of course, because we're communicators, what we put out there really says a lot about our project and our organization. So we wanna make sure it's the best piece we can. And also equally important is to listen for feedback. So as I said, seek praise or don't seek praise, seek criticism. So um, we're not necessarily looking for you know, bad news, but it's important to just keep listening to what people are saying about the information you're putting out. As Catherine uh, was mentioning earlier, you know, metrics is really important and metrics are a part of your listening. It's part of your feedback uh, from your community. So with your donor, talk to them about your reports. Um, you know, you can talk to them in advance of a report. You could share an outline with them. You could ask what else they'd like to see in future communications. But a lot of times this, these discussions are happening a little more casually. Something might get mentioned in a meeting or um, on a call. They might say, oh, I really like that chart. Um, this other project we were working on did this specific thing and I really liked the way they like framed their results. Um, maybe we need more information on something. So just keep all those things in mind and just keep listening, keep adapting. And now we're gonna quickly touch on the importance of consent and disclosures. So this one is not a very um, exciting part necessarily, but I think it's really crucial and incredibly important, especially if you're working with donors through contracts and awards. So um, I am really, really passionate about getting permission before you start an interview. And there's two ways to do this. Um, one is obviously through the disclosure forms. And USAID, if you're working with them, does require a signed disclosure form. It's available on their website in English. And then depending on where you are in the world and what language uh, the person you're interviewing or photographing is, um, is using, we can actually get a um, version of that disclosure form in the local language. So this is really important. The country mission offices for USAID will have access to um, translated disclosure forms. And so you can go ahead and reach out to them. Um, and it's really important because it helps to protect everybody involved um, from the interviewee or the person being photographed. It protects their interests. Um, it obviously protects your organization. And if your funder is US government, then obviously it's protecting the government as well. So it's really important. And just as a reminder, again, the form needs to be offered in the language that the individual can read. So if someone is French speaking and does not read English, please make sure that you're providing them a French form and they need to sign that. And um, I think it's really important. So on top of having this disclosure that you're gonna go ahead and have written and signed, um, we're gonna wanna make sure that we give full clarity um, to the interviewee or the person that we're photographing or taking video of and getting their permission. I think it's really crucial to be upfront about where the photo and interview could potentially be published. So um, even though you're working on your project and you might be imagining that this is going to end up in a report and it's only gonna be seen by your uh, donor's team, the team that's overseeing you, your contracting team, it is very likely that this photo or uh, quotation or any part of it could end up in the donor's social media. It could end up in a presentation, in a video. Um, so we wanna make sure that the person that we're interviewing or photographing is aware that it's not just necessarily for your organization or for your project, it might actually end up on a wider scale to a wider audience. I personally think it's really, really important and I try to advocate for allowing the person that you're wanting to photograph um, or the person you wanna to interview to say no. Give them the opportunity to say no and be very willing to respect that. Um, 
Obviously, sometimes people get kind of pushed out in front, sometimes by, uh, for example, if you're filming at a clinic, perhaps one of the nurses or one of the uh, patients is being requested to be in the photo or to be interviewed, make sure that that person is making the choice and that they have the opportunity to say no if they want to. You know, we're all working in a lot of different environments. Some of us are working in conflict zones. Um, personally, I've worked in Afghanistan and I was very sensitive to this because there are obviously a lot of reasons why someone wouldn't want to be named or photographed for an article. Um, and so I just think it's really crucial and something that doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, be sure that you're willing to hear no and follow through on walking away from that particular subject. Um, be sure that they read and understand the disclosure form, obviously, and get the form signed and keep it on file. So really important, you're gonna submit this with your um, reports and with your success stories. And just a reminder again, we're gonna be answering questions. I see we have quite a number of them, which is awesome. Um, so keep them coming. Uh, the whole team's gonna answer the questions at the end of the webinar, because I don't want you just to hear my experiences. Um, the team here is so much more experienced than me. So I want you to for sure hear their responses. Um, just another couple of quick things. So um, please consider local languages when you are doing your interviews. Um, obviously, in many cases, your funder, if uh, they're in an English speaking country, your donor is possibly gonna require that you translate that into English. But I personally think it's really important to allow the interviewee to be interviewed in the language they feel most comfortable. So then it's up to us as communicators to get it translated um, and get it put um, into English if that's required by our contract or into whichever language. But give your interviewee the opportunity to speak in their own language. You'll find that they are much more comfortable, much more um, forthcoming with great quotes and great stories about the success of your project. Um, and then when you do go to translate, be very careful about translating accurately. Um, sometimes what I see happens is that when you're translating, there's sort of the tendency to like edit the response a little bit, maybe without meaning to make it sound a little more positive or a little uh, different in tone than it was originally meant. So just be sure that you're translating accurately. We want to represent our beneficiaries and anyone that we're interviewing um, as most truthful to what they were actually trying to convey. So I have a couple of skills um, that I think are really useful in communications and a few ways that you can build them. So for five skills, oh, and here's a great communicator. I have five skills, but I only listed four. So maybe I can come up with a fifth one. Um, so this is a perfect example of, I should have edited this one more time. But anyways, um, photography. Photography is a really great skill. If you're lucky, and actually I'd love to ask you all, go ahead and put your hands up if you have a photographer on staff. Um, there's a hands up button at the bottom of your screen. I'm gonna keep an eye on it here and see. Um, how many of you have a someone who does your photography on staff? I'm assuming it's gonna be very few people. And I was right, yes. So you may have the skills to do photography. You may have some people on your team that are great at it, um, but it's pretty rare for an NGO project and a global health project to have full-time photographer, right? So we are the photographers as communicators. We are often the ones. Um, so back in the day, we used to have to use, you know, high-end digital cameras. They were quite finicky um, and it required quite a learning curve. But these days, smartphones are pretty amazing and you can do quite a lot on them. But there are some ways to make it better. Obviously, just having a great phone or a great camera isn't really the whole answer. So learn to take great photos. Study photographers. Um, really focus on when you're drawn to a photo. Why are you drawn to it? Um, what makes it so interesting? Learn how to color grade photos. You can actually do this quite easily now on most smartphones um, in the actual camera app. But there's also apps you can download for free or for paid and uh, use them to color grade. So color grade is you know, um, boosting the color or making the contrast a little stronger. These types of things can really take um, a lackluster photo and make it phenomenal. So it, it's, it's a really useful tool. Um, and videography, filming and editing, this is also one of those things that, you know, it's a full-time job, but for those of us uh, in communications, it's often something we have to dabble in a little bit. 
So again, the smartphones are phenomenal. There's a lot of apps um, and a lot of free software that you can use for these. So study what types of videos your donor is putting out um, and focus a little bit on what makes them interesting and what makes them compelling. I think interview skills are a really crucial um, tool for us as communicators. So study how great interviewers make people comfortable. Um, something I see quite often with new interviewers is that when they set up an interview, they sit down and they start the interview. Um, and I think you'll find if you're ever on the other end of that, if you're ever the one being interviewed, that's fairly unnerving. Uh, it's not really fun to have somebody uh, sort of step in and just start right away asking you questions. So make sure that you're making someone feel very comfortable, have some you know, casual conversation before you start on the questions and make sure you ask open-ended questions. This is another one I see quite often. Someone will say, um, you know, so uh, did our project help you get results? And the beneficiary might say, yes. Well, that's the end of that question. You're gonna have to ask another one to follow up to try and get them to give you more information. So make sure you're asking open-ended questions. Um, go ahead and ask, you know, what type of um, results did you see? How were we helping your project? Um, how are you benefiting from this? So go ahead and use those open-ended ones. And then graphic design. So maybe this one could be four and five since it covers a lot of different things. Um, I really recommend um, getting some basic graphic design background. You don't have to go necessarily through university or anything for it. You can do a lot on YouTube and online, but have some understanding of how to visualize data, how to make it more interesting, not just charts and graphs, but infographics. Um, and you can use Google and, and uh, Pinterest to search what other people are doing in reports. Um, understand the basics of good design and formatting. So for example, this slide, um, I have a fair amount of text on it. So I kept everything else super, super simple. Um, that is a basic of good design. Keeping it clean, um, using a minimal number of colors, a minimal number of fonts, different fonts, um, and just you know, sort of focusing on the formatting. And then obviously with graphic design, some of the most useful software for us is Adobe InDesign, um, Photoshop, Illustrator, but there are a lot of free versions of similar software that you can use. Um, so go ahead and start you know, uh, doing some you know, exercises and playing a little bit with graphic design. It'll make your reports much better. All right, and then just a quick note about getting your whole team involved. So obviously you're the communicator, that's your job, um, but you know, your whole team has great ideas. So keep checking in with your team in the field. Um, I always say, you know, good ideas are coming from everywhere. So make sure that you're touching base with everybody and that you're open to everyone's ideas. If you have technical staff that's gonna go do a site visit, um, you, know, you can ask them to take some photos, provide them some guidelines, provide them the disclosure forms, or you can tag along and go ahead and take those photos yourself. For your M&E team, if they're planning a survey, maybe they could include some open-ended questions so you can you know, uh, find some trends or some uh, project results that you might be able to share with your donors. And then let's talk through how does USAID share your results? So we've produced all this great work. We've got these you know, success stories and these photos and we've done so much work. Where does it show up? So obviously reports and things, of course, that's, that's our main part likely. Um, but USAID actually has several different online platforms that they use. So their main website um, for sharing success stories uh, is called Transforming Lives or Stories, depending on um, the, the link that you use. And then the Office of HIV AIDS also has its own blog. So they're in addition to the main website sharing this as well. And we'll go ahead and share all those links later. Um, for newsletters, now this one's an interesting one because um, these are two different newsletters, so they have two very different audiences. So USAID has um, an overall newsletter that you can sign up for on the website. And I noticed someone had asked the question about how do you implement an email newsletter for your organization? Well, there's a lot of um, free or trial version um, platforms that you could use, um, like MailChimp or things like that. 
Um, but one of the best ways is once you kind of get signed up on that, go ahead and put a newsletter sign up form on your website. So before you even developed your first newsletter, you can start capturing emails um, in a way that follows regulations and guidelines. And that way you have an audience built in once you have a chance to build your newsletter and send it out. So for USAID, obviously their main newsletter is covering you know, the American people and people all over the world. So it has a bit more of a general focus. And then the Office of HIV AIDS has um, a note to implementing partners. And this one obviously has a little bit of a different audience as well. And again, we will uh, provide links for all of that so you can get signed up if you're not currently on those mailing lists. And of course, USAID uses a ton of different types of social media. Um, again, this is a really great place to go and observe before you interact. So go and keep an eye on how they speak through Facebook. What are they sharing? Um, how, what kind of tone are they using? Um, they're gonna speak differently as Catherine was mentioning. You know, you speak differently on Twitter. You use a lot more photos. Um, obviously things like Instagram is very photo heavy. So go ahead and we'll provide all these links to you and go through and, and use it as research to kind of see best practices. Um, one I wanted to mention is Medium. I'm not sure if everyone's as familiar with that one, but it is mainly a writing platform. So um, that's an interesting one to sort of see the type of writing they're looking for. So as I said before, just make it really easy for your donor, but also for media to share. So high resolution photo files, um, disclosure and consent forms for your donors, strong data visualization, and make sure that it's basically ready to go straight out of the box. You've finished the article, you've finished the success story uh, or the report presentation, and it is ready to be shared on. Um, it's edited, it looks great, and it's good to go. So we'll just go through a few USAID resources, um, and then I'm gonna be very excited to introduce um, Sky from Right to Care with her presentation. So um, some of the resources that USAID has, again, we'll provide links to everything, is the style guide. So the style guide uh, explains a little bit about how to write for USAID, and it's really useful. Um, it has some fantastic um, little tips like acronyms and abbreviations, which when you're working with a donor for the first time is often you know, quite the learning curve. Um, they have a section on troublesome terms, which is really useful. So there are some terms that USAID or your donor might be using um, that might not be that common otherwise. And it may even be written in a way that maybe is not as common in the dictionary, um, the way it's hyphenated, the way it's capitalized. Uh, so these style guides are really important. And your organization should have a style guide as well. So that's really useful. If you don't have one, um, it's up to us as communicators to go ahead and start making one. Uh, so we will see, you know, if maybe we even do a webinar down the road about how to develop a style guide. Uh, USAID has this great messaging manual. So um, it was published in 2019 and it's still completely applicable. We'll again provide a link to it. And it's great tips for writing and photography. Um, and one thing about photography that I think is really crucial is the rule of thirds. So of all the things I've ever learned about photography, this is the thing um, I think made the biggest difference in the quality of my photos. So the rule of thirds is um, basically you break up a um, photo into a section of nine, even though, yeah, so hold on one sec. So here we go, this is sort of the grid. And what you're looking for is to place your uh, subject, the person that you're photographing, um, in a section of these grids. So I think it's really common for people to always think that they should take a photo and have the subject right in the middle of their uh, photo. You can do that. Um, I wouldn't recommend it all the time. I think it's much more interesting for the eye, for the person to be offset. So as you can see at the top photo on the left, um, she and the, the two subjects are sort of taking up two thirds of the page. And at the bottom, same thing. She's taking up two thirds of the whole photo. So it's a little bit offset. Uh, it sounds sort of silly, uh, but when I started doing this with my photos, it really changed the quality of my photography. And I really recommend it, especially for us, it's these little tips that we can implement that are really important. 
And if you want to look at more USAID uh, photos, they have a um, exposure is another website that they post things on quite often. And it's mainly for photojournalism. So it's really useful to take a look at how they're um, sharing these photos, what the composition is, how people are standing or positioned in these photos. Um, it's a really useful tool. All right, so that's gonna be it for me. My one more reminder is just that you should never stop learning. I know you're not, of course, you're all here and you're uh, obviously lifelong learners, but I know for me, communications is constantly changing. Some of the most important parts stay the same, but so many things change so quickly, especially with you know technology, social media, um, all sorts of things. So just go ahead and keep learning, um, keep attending webinars, Google search, watch a YouTube video, there's so many different ways. It helps to keep your organization ahead of the curve and of course also helps to build your resume so that you can make future projects even better. So at this time, I think I'm gonna skip ahead from questions. We're gonna go ahead and answer at the end. And I am going to turn it over to Right to Care and introduce Sky again. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this presentation. So go ahead, Sky. so much. Um, it's an absolute honor to be with all of you today. Good afternoon and good morning to everybody across the world. And I think that based on the excellent insights that Catherine and Susan shared, I'd like to demonstrate some of the examples of how right to care use storytelling and communications in unpacking the layers of of our program to our different audiences. I'm not only going to focus on communication, but also on program implementation and how important storytelling is to weave that into the implementation of our programs. My name is Sky Grove, and I, I head up social and behavior change communication for Right to Care. And like I said, it's an honor to be with you today to listen, to learn, and to share. If we can move to the next slide, please. So a short, a short overview of right to care. Um, what, I, I see that we're still on the previous slide. There we go. A short overview of right to care and what seemed to be on this slide as a lot of headings has layers and layers of stories behind it. This year is the 21st anniversary of right to care. What is now South Africa's leading health NGO with more than 50 partnership internationally and locally innovations like pharmacy um, automation and milestones like running the largest HIV treatment site in the world started with a vision. The story of providing access to people living, in, living with HIV to critical life-saving medication in a time in South Africa when AIDS and nihilism was rife. Um, it started with us with, with the story of our founder and CEO, Dr. E, P P Professor Ian Zane who believe that we all have the right to care, to fight locally and globally for access with, um, to, to ARVs and to medication and treatment for people living with HIV. The, the, so the impact of right to care's work would not certainly not have been possible. And this slide demonstrates just a couple of the highlights that we would like to, that we are demonstrating within our 20 year, 21 first year of, of uh, um, anniversary. Um, and this impact would not have been possible um, through, without the support of the American people through PEPFAR and the trust and support that donors have placed in us to take the vision and the original mission of Right to Care in saving life and having the Right to Care forward. What we did throughout the years, telling stories of our programs, and that touch the heart and mind of our, our, our clients, our beneficiaries, our patients, our communities, and our donors. And today is just a quick example of some of those stories that we have learned throughout the years. Next slide, please. So today's story specifically is going to feature our medical male circumcision program that is evidently also celebrating a major milestone this year. It is 10 years since the start of our PEPFAR funded VMMC program in South Africa. And in this time, since April, 2012, we performed more than 1.4 million circumcisions. 
our demand creation and social behavior change approaches in achieving that uh, alongside our implementation teams have been highlighted by South African, um, the, the, the Ministry, Department of Health, as well as our funders as some of the most successful public health um, promotion and communication um, um, highlights in recent years. So what have we learned as a VMMC program during this time? Next slide, please. Very importantly, um, design your program for storytelling. Storytelling and, and communications is at the heart of our program design. In fact, it is every single person in our program and right to care's responsibility to look out and to have communication in mind, not only the demand creation or communication teams. It's the responsibility of the CEO, the chief of parties, the M&E and CQI teams, the clinical associates, the nurses. Um, and I have no doubt that this culture of communication, of sharing stories that has added to this program and other programs success um, over the years at right to care We identify, like described in this slide, at least one significant story as a milestone activity each year. Now, this milestone story then becomes integrated and ingrained in the way through which the program is implemented. Now, as I said, not, not only through the communications. So we, we think beforehand, as we've heard before, plan for communications. How are we going to document the progress, unpack the layers of stories of the program, um, involve our communities in, in documenting and telling their own stories. Very importantly, that we don't helicopter in to a community, but it's really community-based storytelling that we are after. And then very importantly, all of those platforms that we've seen earlier today, deciding on which platform is the most appropriate to share, share um, uh, which story. So I'd, I'd like to highlight one specific milestone here. There's a number that you can see on your screen, but um, um, a milestone has been in the storytelling of Right to Care, the story of Isabaya Samadoda, which is the which is loosely translated from, from Zulu to the circle of men that is implemented by the late king um, of the Zulu nation, King Goodwill Zulu team, his son, um, Prince Nshlanganiso Zulu. The Zulu nation has traditionally been an uncircumcising community, but also, but have experienced the highest um, percentage of HIV infections or the highest prevalence of HIV infections in the world in, in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. In uh, a number of years ago, the, the king of the Zulu nation, King Goodwill of Latini, um, um, offered a decree that Zulu men will take up circumcision again as a HIV protection mechanism. And this, this pattern he passed to his son, Prince Nshanganiso. Prince, Prince started working on a concept called Isabaya Samadoda, where he wanted to dialogue with men about the social norms, about the uptake of a change of social norms in a cultural setting, about from going from non-circumcising to circumcising. And um, it, throughout this time, Ratiki has worked with Prince Nshlanganiso. So that we have changed Isabaya Samadoda not only into a healthcare HIV prevention program, but at the moment as a full 360 degree um, um, approach to men's health. We know that men are the culprits when it comes to healthcare and that they la don't like to, to visit healthcare facilities. But through Isabaya Samadoda, we're looking at the total package of the man, of the man not only the medical um, circumcision aspect. Um, we're looking at non-communicable diseases, COVID-19 prevention, uh, vaccination, in fact, the Isabaya Samadoda concept has, through storytelling, through in-depth unpacking of the nuances of both culturally as uh, contextual, as well as the medical aspect, it has, has grown into a movement. And that has, that has grown even bigger since the, the, the very sad and untimely passing of King Goodwill Zulatini last year. And Prince Nshanganiso's 
um, movement is about Zama Dodo has spanned, is spanning now across the Zulu nation into touching the hearts and minds of men across South Africa, not only the most, uh, our, our biggest population in South Africa that, that are the, that the Zulu nation. Next slide, please. So how do we start with um, un unpacking communication, um, telling the stories? We start with the most important that we believe um, communication skill, and that is listening. It is common for people to hear what is said, but hearing is a lot different to listening. We listen, we take in the information, not just to hear, but to really actively participate in the conversation. And I think very often in situations where targets are very uh, uh, um, high on the priority list, we don't take the time to listen to our audiences and our beneficiaries and our clients enough. But not only does active listening make, um, make you a better communicator, but it also in, in, instills trust and confidence in the person that you do communicate with, whether it is a potential client, a beneficiary that has some personal issues that they need to deal with. And I think that, that I, can, I can personally say, working in this program since, since for the last six years, it is through active listening to our communities that, we, that right to care designed many of our programs. One example is the design of South Africa's first integrated approach to traditional male initiation. We engage traditional leaders. Traditional initiation is a very is is a is a is a practice that um, or is 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 a is a cultural right, a very sacred practice that occurs across Africa, not only in South Africa, and through active listening and 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 um, co-design with traditional leaders. We, we, we heard that traditional leaders um, are concerned about the health and the safety of their initiates, that they, but, but that culture really takes precedent and that, it, that there was skepticism in a lot of traditional communities about the clinical approach of in hospital, an in-hospital uh, medical male circumcision. And I think that because we learned, we, we listened, what um, to the to the cultural gatekeepers, um, we we designed a program that integrates medical male circumcision or or safe circumcision, shall I say, in a non medical uh, setting in inside initiation schools. So this led to South Africa's first culturally led integration of safe safe circumcision in non medical settings of initiation schools across a number of traditional populations that practices um, TMI. And to date, we have circumcised more than eight, 80,000 young men as part of their sacred journey from adolescence to manhood. Next slide, please. Success in your program is absolutely more than awareness. For those people working on a course that we care about, the first instinct is often to make sure that as many people as possible are aware of the problem. So when we care about an issue and we talk about it, it's natural for us to want other people to care as much as we do. Um, because surely we reason that if people know, have the knowledge, they will act accordingly. We think and we know that, or we, we believe that if people know that using condoms is critical in preventing HIV, the spread of, spread of HIV, then they would use it every time. But that is a fallacy. The perspective persists in our world though of nonprofits marketing and often in public relations and communications. Um, we often cite when it comes to recording and reporting on our stories, awareness, attitudes and action objectives. But, and we have traditionally learned that awareness precedes action. Many of the foremost public relations and advertising agencies still report results in the form of impressions, the number of people that are exposed to the message. But what we have learned is knowledge, and I think all of us here, acknowledge um, of a subject does absolutely not translate to action. 
For example, um, research in South Africa show that 85% of men have been exposed and know about the benefit, the health benefits of medical male circumcision. Yet we have only successfully circumcised less, just less than about 60% of our, our male population. This shown this shows that people that have given information are unlikely to change their beliefs or behavior. So it's time for us as organizations to drive change beyond just raising awareness. Um, aware, awareness, the focusing on awareness only often wastes my, time and money. And instead, what we are, what, what Right to Care is doing is through deep strategic communication and, and social behavior change, we um, use behavioral science to craft campaigns that use messaging and concrete calls to action to get more people to change the way that they think or feel or act. And as, as a result, create a long lasting change as we've seen in the number of men that's that right to circumcised successfully. Next slide, please. One of the most important tasks in, in crafting the story and um, the, the communication and social behavior change campaigns that we embark on is to identify your target audience, to know exactly who it is that you're speaking, the in individuals or groups whose action and behavior you would like to see change and you would like to record the change accordingly. So through and this is, this is a, a photograph of Prince Nshlanganiso standing on a chair, addressing a, a, a group of men around Isabaya Samadora, the circle of men, and um, embracing change, embracing a, a, a more serious approach to taking care of their health that it involves not only VMMC, but other infectious and, and non-communicable diseases too. So, um, Prince Nshlanganiso know his target audience. He knows the, the context. And in, in, as such, right of care working closely with him, co-design our, our beha behavior change and our demand creation, creation packages to really speak to the heart and mind of, the, of our audiences. Next slide, please. So in order to to target and, and tell the story of your program to your potential clients, you have to create profiles of who it is that you are targeting. I think that you can click again, if there is just a, and again, thank you so much. So this, this profile we have put together with, one of, with our demand creation team in one of our um, urban areas. And um, we have come up with a profile of a later doctor of the UMFC. So standing at about just under 60%, the men that have not taken up the MMC or circumcision as an HIV prevention mechanism, we, have, we are creating profiles of those men that identify who are, what are the barriers and enablers that possibly might convince or um, enable him to take up circumcision. Um, this was co-created, like I said, not only with our demand creation team, but also with circumcised as well as uncircumcised men in one of our urban areas. And we do a couple of these profiles to demonstrate um, in detail, what are those touch points of communication, of storytelling, engagement with the potential client that, that might change his behavior. Um, if you know your audience, your communication will be more personalized, more trustworthy, and have much more credibility. Next slide, please. Very importantly, choose your messenger carefully. Um, people trust who they can relate to. And we've seen this with, in these three examples. First of all, we found out that men really trust having conversation with doctors in a white uniform, a stethoscope around his neck, and they feel that they, they're speaking to somebody really credible. So what we've done is to, to, to set up a profile called Ask Dr. K, that is on, on Facebook. Uh, Dr. K is Dr. Kumulani Moyo, our chief of party. 
um, that has been leading the right to care uh, VMMC program since its inception in 2012. Dr. K became that person, not only a, a, a personality, but a real person behind a screen that were able and are able to answer in depth questions, very personal questions of men wanting to be circumcised or men asking about art, aftercare. And Dr. K with his history in circumcision, having done thousands of circumcisions himself, are able to answer authentically and in detail and, um, and, and really instills trust in the right to care program and knowing that we do care not only about the client before the circumcision, but absolutely afterwards while, I, while he is recovering. The second uh, picture of this is, is of a, a very um, well-known actor and musician in South Africa called Kajiso Mandupe. We, we engaged Kajiso uh, when he was about 30 years old. And he had a lot of fears around circumcision. He was willing because of his, his, his profile. He played in a very popular soap um, series and have, have gone on to produce movies, um, international award-winning movies, um, and very focused on, on um, societal and, and tra um, change communication like gender-based violence. Um, and he was very open with us about the difficulties that he personally faced of taking the step to be circumcised. So what we, just, what, what we curated together with Kajiso is his journey and we documented every single process from, from him being open about his fears of pain, um, of is it not too late to be circumcised in your thirties? We created a campaign that not only told uh, Kajiso's story, but really drew men in. And towards a, a big national circumcision day that we, um, we did with Kajiso, he was interviewed on TV. He almost had his circumcision recorded live on TV, but, but, but our television stations were there when he was circumcised. He was circumcised by a female doctor also addressing some of the fears or some of the preconceived idea that men has about, about female healthcare workers. And, um, and at the end, the main reason why Kajiso chose to be circumcised is because his, his aunt, um, his, his wife's aunt died of cervical cancer. And we know that, that one of the, um, the reasons or one of the preventative measures of, of uh, circumcision, medical male circumcision, is preventing the HPV virus, the leading cause of cervical cancer, to be transmitted between um, males and females. So Kajiso remains an ambassador. After his campaign, he is still speaking and touching the hearts and minds of, of, yeah, of older men that is now our, our target for circumcision. And those men that have built resistance, that are the later doctors, that really do are, are difficult to convince to take this up. The third picture is 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 our favorite prince, uh, Prince Nuslanganiso, as I as I explained earlier. And um, what is what is very pertinent is that even though um, mourning his, the, the 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 passing of of his father, um, he's active the the, the the, the way in which, in which he is actively pursuing his father's original vision to speak to the hearts of men and write a kid co-designing with him the stories that will appeal not only now to Zulu men, but to men across South Africa um, is, is significant. In a, in a, in an, a campaign that we did together with, with uh, Prince Shlanganiso in one of our urban areas, um, we managed to year by year see and saw, saw an increase of 147% of uptake in VMMCs because we followed a culturally led approach. We told the stories of social norms of hesitancy in um, um, led by culture as opposed to the, the benefits of VMMC because many men, many men wants to hear and have their concerns addressed as opposed to be given information as I indicated before. Next slide, please. Create storytellers in your team. 
So I know that, and from what we've seen earlier, we don't, not everybody has a communication team. Many people are on their own um, in, in, in terms of communication um, when it comes to your programs. But these, these, these people on the picture are all members of the Writer Key team, and they are all trained storytelling storytellers. They have their own, own individual stories of the MMC, from men that underwent traditional circumcision, to men that were too scared to circumcise, to clinical styles who know the program inside out, to female partners of um, circumcised and uncircumcised men, each having and sharing their own story about the health benefits of the MMC. And creating storytellers within your, within your team is once again going right back to the, fir to the first or the second slide of pre-planning your communication and the way that you're going to tell the story of your program um, throughout the, the duration of the program. Next slide, please. This is a this this is it was a very special moment that we managed to capture and tell the story about. Um, but we always prepared to capture those unexpected moments and to document the stories. But also remember that stories affect people's lives and permission, as as Susan has rightfully said, should be sought to tell stories, especially deeply personal ones. During Princeton Shanganisel's first appearance after the passing of his father, a young boy, Dico Lamini, did a praise song about the late king and the legacy that the prince is, is, is carrying by continuing to fight TB, HIV, gender-based violence, and, and, and generally looking at, at men's health. Dico lost his father in the same week that the late king died due to an infectious disease. And seen in this picture is Diko with Prince Shanganiso and Princess Konza, his, um, the prince's sister. Um, and, all, um, and, and what Diko did is he went on stage very unscripted and he, he sang a praise song about the late king as well as the, the royal family, the, especially led by, by Prince Shanganiso. And it was this touch not only and told not only um, the story of, of, of thank you, but also the deep emotional connection of loss and of sharing moments, um, of founding solidarity in loss and a common ground in sharing their own stories. Um, we told Diku's stories with his mother's permission and the prince subsequently arranged Diku to be taken under the wing of one of the Induna or the chiefs in the area and is now a young motivational speaker addressing adolescent boys about the importance of social norms. Um, and he wants to be a VMC nurse one day when he grows up. Next slide, please. Exploring different channels. We have gone into a number of details on this and I'm not gonna elaborate, but there is a channel for every single story. Um, one, of the, one of the channels that we are finding in the program that is really taking off in South Africa is TikTok. And we have a number of ambassadors on TikTok sharing the circumcision stories and motivating men to, to circumcise, sharing their own personal stories. Um, and, and, and a scene in, in, in Susan and Catherine's presentation earlier, um, I would implore you to make sure that you explore every possible channel available to document and to share your story. Next slide, please. So we have a philosophy at Right to Care that data is the summary of a thousand stories. But how do we measure the success of storytelling of communication and demand creation? We've seen some indications of measuring impact and and, and, and reach. And we uh, decided also, as we know that we have to present data as part of, of the success stories and the, the progress updates of, uh, to our donors, we created a, a demand creation, monitoring and evaluation uh, cascade. And I think that we all agree that data outcomes is critical, is no, now more critical than ever before. So in, to, in order to do this, this cascade, 
um, that 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 measures or that that speaks of three or four different aspects of engagement throughout the VMMC cycle have been developed. It consists out of reach bookings, um, reach leads bookings, and MMCs performed. And let me just tell you how we apply this in our daily work. Next slide, please. So we con we we calculate conversion rates um, to show the, the impact of our demand creation activities. Um, in the slide, what we do is that we use the remunerator as MMCs perform and the denominator as the number of leads generated uh, following a very specific communication or demand creation um, intervention. And what we do is to report weekly on each of these. If you go to the next slide. And, and in this, this way, in the previous slide, we, we, we um, the, the, the demand creation cascade, we report on our conversion rates across all of the demand creation modalities, um, some of which is demonstrated here, um, so, uh, some others not. And by reporting at, and looking at these, this data every single week, we can see what worked, what didn't work, and adjust our planning, our decision-making processes, and who to reach um, every week. Um, it is very important, um, demand creation, uh, social mobilization is incredibly important across all of uh, right to case programs. And the ability to measure the impact of our input is becoming so important. The return on investment of everything that you put in versus everything that you that you get out. Um, have, have, and this model have, have now been adopted across all of the VMMC implementation partners in South Africa. And we use data in all of our decision-making processes in our program. And we absolutely believe in the philosophy that if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. To, to, to end off, next slide, please. Um, what we've learned in our in, in right to care is that stories that inspire chains have seven elements. Firstly, there's a story for everybody. No matter which, uh, no matter if it's a if, if if it's a donor, a potential partner, potential donor, a potential beneficiary or client, all beneficiaries, there's a story for everybody. The the the, the, the through active listening and engagement we can find those stories that will touch the hearts and minds. Stories make more, stories makes um, difficult com concepts more relatable, complex concepts like intersectionality, like um, migration, like um, refugees, like VMC, which is a, which is a, 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 a surgical prevention mechanism to do if you, for something that you might get. Um, stories instill trust because people relate to people. If I tell my personal story about a topic, um, for example, what, we do, what we're doing at the moment is doing a lot of demand creation and social mobilization around the uptake of the, the COVID-19 vaccine. And what we are seeing is that sharing personal stories around people's experience with COVID um, really instills trust for those that are still hesitant to take the vaccine, to open up and share their own hesitancies that, that, that often they're ashamed to, to, to bring out in the open. Sh um, stories demonstrate social change. Um, we have, there, there's so many examples of how stories and really empathetic community-based people-centered storytelling have, have, have brought about social change. The fact that Right to Care has, uh, together with some of, of uh, um, advocacy groups in, in a time of AIDS and nihilism managed to um, provide access to people living with HIV um, to life-saving medication. A lot of this happened through storytelling, through social change. And, and these stories instilled a lot of change 
to the level of policy change that South Africa now runs the world's largest HIV and AIDS um, treatment um, program. Stories connect people with each other. Um, the commonality of our humanity, especially in these times, people want to relate to each other in a deeper and a more meaningful way. And we as, as implementing partners, as in the NGO sector, I believe that we have the responsibility to connect with our people, with our beneficiaries, as opposed to chasing targets. And I know that it is a juggle between these two aspects, but it is, it is critically connecting and trust is really the most precious commodities that we have at the moment. Stories um, that, that have a clear call to action um, makes it easy to act upon. So everything that we communicate about our VMC program, it has a very clear call to action. To find out more, what's up us on this number? Or send a please call me. I'm not sure if this is a, this is an, a, a concept that is also um, available in other countries. But um, speak to us. We can, we can address your concerns. The, the, the easy referral pathway is critical when we tell stories and we communicate with, with our, our clients, our beneficiaries, and our patients. Stories impacts has to be measurable. We have to put more um, measures in place to, 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 to see how stories communication leads to change in our programs. And, and stories that inspire change also have a clear structure and a purpose. The same way that Susan has explained to us earlier in this presentation about how to structure together a, a success story with pull quotes, with, with, with personal um, anecdotes, with data, with high quality pictures. So, um, and, and these principles for right to care is being used to tell not only the story of EMMC, but the story of the organization that has grown from one person's vision to employing more than five, 4,500 4, staff across a number of countries. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to get in touch with anybody and everybody on this call. And I, I would like to, um, to, 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 to guide you to some of the places that you can get in touch with us. Our, um, our website address, our LinkedIn address, and all of our social media, and there is my, my personal email address. And um, we would really like to get in touch and let's share our stories and share our learnings. And next slide, please. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share some of the learnings. I have certainly learned a great deal. Your questions are very insightful and I'm really looking forward to some of the feedback, the comments and hearing your own stories. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sky. That was fantastic. Um, you know, there's so much good information in there and I know that these webinars go very quickly. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that this webinar has been recorded and we will be going ahead and sharing that recording with you. It'll be online tomorrow morning. And Fikre has added the link throughout the chat. So you can scroll through the chat and find the link there. Um, that's where all of our ASAP webinars are held. And we'll go ahead and make sure it's there by tomorrow morning. And through the questions, um, they've been getting answered through um, our team in the back end here. They're uh, typing in answers. So you can go ahead and view the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll address a few of them here as well. But I just wanted to let you know, since there's so much good information here, um, that Marguerite from IntraHealth has gone ahead and added in for answers. We're going to make sure that we pull that Q&A out of the recording, and we'll provide it as a separate document on the website tomorrow. So there's a lot of really good questions and a lot of really good answers. Um, so we're going to make sure that those are all available to you. So a couple of the questions that I'd love to address right now, um, one of them was about the disclosure form uh, for USAID and how to access that. So I'm gonna make sure uh, that's linked up in our presentation, but I'll also make sure it's a link on our website tomorrow um, on the page for this recording, this webinar. 
Um, and then we have a lot of great questions. So I know they've been answered, but I'd love to get the rest of our team an opportunity to answer some of them as well. We do have a poll running right now that's a general poll about the webinar. So please feel free to fill that out. But in the meantime, um, let me look a few of these questions up and see if I can pose them to our team. Um, so there was a great question about what do you do if um, the individual that you're interviewing or photographing is not able to read or write the disclosure. Um, so for me in the past, when I've had this experience, what I've done is that I recorded, um, at the time I was doing only an audio interview, um, they didn't wanna be on video. And so I recorded them, me reading out the full disclosure to them and them providing um, that they understood and that they were giving acceptance and consent. So that's something that I've done in the past. Um, for the rest of my team, feel free to speak up and, and say if you have a different approach to that. You can also speak to um, your COR um, about how they'd like to handle a situation like that. But in my experience, either an audio or a video um, reading of the disclosure, so make sure you get both on the recording, um, has worked for um, someone who isn't able to read the disclosure at all. Again, though, make sure that you go out of your way to try and provide it in the language um, that they are comfortable with. Um, all right, so a couple of questions I wonder if our team could answer. We do have about 10 minutes left. Um, how can we know what our audiences want to hear from us? So this is a really good question. I'd love everyone to um, provide an answer to this one. So Marguerite um, brought up a great point of keeping an eye on your analytics. So if you're already sending out a newsletter, or if you already have um, some social media platforms, you can keep an eye on analytics and see what people are clicking on, because that's giving you a sense of what they like. Um, but I wonder if Catherine or Sky would like to um, answer that further. Um, they were asking, how can we know what our audiences want to hear from us? Do you recommend using surveys? How else can we check in with our audience? Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, I can be, say something really quickly. I would just go back um, to just monitoring feedback from your analytics and the comments that people put in the pieces of your social media. Um, any feedback you receive on social media is really helpful. We also get feedback from people via email. Um, and then it is an industry practice to send out, usually you send out a survey once a year via email to all of your subscribers just figuring out what they like, what they don't like, um, asking kind of what was their favorite content. And you usually don't get a huge response from that survey, but it's always really helpful to, to get some responses and hear what people want. So I would say that's a good second option is maybe sending out a survey to your subscribers once a year, once every two years, just to get an idea. Thank you, Catherine and Susan. From my side, um, um, what what our audience would like to hear, and in this in this case, we, I would like to include our beneficiaries, patients, and clients. And what we do before we start a program is to engage very deeply on community level through very specific community entry programs. There is, I think, that if, uh, it's very important, and there's a saying that I'm sure that you're all aware of us aware about. Um, nothing for us without us. And this is to engage our audiences and, and, and involve them. That, that is both from um, ministries of health, local mission offices, um, clients, uh, beneficiaries, to have in, um, um, what we call co-design workshops to see what it is that is really um, needed on, on, a, on a contextual level. Because context um, um, is, differs from from one district, from one province, from one ward to the net, to the next so often. And it is very important to keep that context in mind because the information needs might vary very um, vastly between all of these um, geographic regions and, and cultural contexts. Excellent. Yes, I think, um, you know, context is obviously changes depending on where you are. And it's so important to make sure, you know, as communicators, we're learning a lot of skills. And sometimes we try to apply something we've done on a past project directly into a current one. But, um, you know, we talked a lot about audience and really considering who your audience is. So make sure that you're 
you know, uh, crafting your, your story and your communications for your current context, for your current project um, and your patients. Uh, let's see. Uh, so there was a great question about sharing appropriate steps for developing a success story. Um, to be honest, to developing a success story is very similar to developing any media article. And so, you know, again, one of the best things you can do is kind of study what's out there. So study newspaper articles, study what's on USAID's current website. Um, and there are some great guidance and tips that are in the messaging manual and a few other places. So we'll make sure that we link that up on the website. Um, but does anyone have any tips they'd like to add to that? I feel like Sky does for sure. Yes, I think I think that you've really covered it. Um, Catherine, you have really uh, dealt with in depth. So unless there's a more detailed sort of a nuanced question, I think that 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 I, I would certainly agree with, with your feedback. Sounds good. Um, let's see. So we had a couple questions about like how many photos should be included with a success story. Um, on the website, usually USA publishes one, but they are expanding. Um, something that I didn't show you is the storytelling hub, um, which I should have included in there, but I'll make sure I link it. Um, and through exposure and medium and through their social media and through the storytelling hub, they're doing a lot of photojournalism. So that's very useful, to be honest. I'm sure everyone in the team will agree. The more photos, the better. The more photos you take, the better. Um, you know, it'll allow you to really kind of pick through the ones that you think are best to include. And also it'll allow you to repackage. You might use a different photo on social media than you do when you send it into USAID for the success story. Perhaps you may include a few of them in your blog post or on your website, um, and certainly in your reports, you can have tons of photos. So um, I think, you know, more is better, definitely. Um, of course, with and, consent and disclosures. Go ahead, Kevin. I, I also want to bring up, um, at least for our website and our blog and our news stories, we often um, have situations in which we don't have any photos. Um, and that is a really, um, what we've done, the solution that we've found is you don't always need a photo, um, but we also use graphics as a great way to um, bring our message across without actually showing people's faces or a photo from the story. Um, I know that Canva is a really great free tool for people to create graphics. Um, and we have a set of graphics that we, our graphic designer at InterHealth has designed um, in case we don't have a photo and you still want to um, kind of get the theme across or show some sort of visual visualization with the, with the story as well. Perfect, excellent. And that's something that I also didn't mention in the uh, thing, but is sort of like a common sort of uh, pain point for me is to make sure that any photos um, and graphics that you're using, you have permission and the license to use those. Not everything on the internet is free to use just because it's available there. Um, so really make sure, uh, as Catherine mentioned, through things like Canva, there are many uh, free stock photography sites as well. Um, if you do need to pull a graphic from something else, if you don't have the team to make it yourself, just make sure that it's um, you have the permission to use it. That's really important, especially because all of us are, in many cases, representing our organizations, but also our donors and our funders. So an important consideration as well. Um, so let's see here if we could grab one more and then we're almost out of time. Um, uh, we did okay. have a, oh yeah, go ahead. So apologies. And um, there's a very interesting question in the, in the chat box from, from Grace um, Gwenda that asks um, if Writer Care has both a, a social behavior change strategy, guiding strategy, as well as a separate communication strategy for the organization. Do you mind if I, if I take that one? Go for it. So absolutely we do. Um, in fact, my uh, chief marketing officer, Spukasi Somi, is on this call and on the webinar. Um, so Sipukasi and I works very closely together. So yes, even though that um, there is, the two are absolutely interlinked, you know, telling the stories of our, our programs versus the corporate positioning of Right to Care. So we do have two, um, two strategies um, very much um, feeding into each other and, and um, the, um, elevating the, 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 the good stories 
and the evidence in reaching our targets as well as the positioning for the for the organization. Excellent, perfect. Yes, and I know that's a common question. We've had other um, communications webinars where that was a question because of course, we're all trying to do so much with sometimes um, a smaller staff than we would like. And um, that's often a question as well, you know, what type of strategies do you need? How many different types of strategies do you need? So that's excellent. And I actually just noticed from our survey, um, when we were asking everybody about future communications webinars, actually communication strategies from start to finish is one they'd really like to see. So um, I think that's something we would love to work on on our end. Um, and maybe I could grab this team to help me out with that. We'll see if they uh, agree after this webinar. Um, but I just wanted to uh, close out. We're right at the top of the hour now. And I wanted to thank everybody so much. Again, we are able to put these webinars on because of the support of USAID and PEPFAR for the ASAP project. We're really excited to be here every week. We'll be here uh, throughout March. We have a webinar every week. And at the end of the month, I think we have two uh, per week. So I just wanted to thank again our presenters. Thank you so much, Catherine and Sky. Um, your information and breaking it down more is exactly what we were hoping to get out of this webinar. So really appreciate it. And I'd like to open it up if uh, anyone would like to say some final words. I'll start. Um, thank you so much, Susan and Sky. That was fantastic. I learned so much from both of you. Um, and if anyone needs to get in contact me, with me, um, I'm happy to um, share my email um, through this, this webinar. And please, please contact me if you have any questions. Um, and please follow InterHealth on all of our social media sites. <laughs> thank you. The same comment from me. Um, very insightful, good to connect with, with, with colleagues and like-minded individuals across um, the globe. Um, a lot of learnings today and looking forward to, pre to, to future um, presentations and webinars. The same um, invitation, open invitation to engage. Let's continue to learn from each other and never stop learning. Perfect, thank you so much. And Jeff, if you don't mind, Go ahead and close us out. We'll see you all next week.